So welcome everybody. Six by Six is virtual social. Great to see everybody here as usual. Familiar faces and one or two um, new names there on the roster. Um, unbelievable to think we're, we're now into kind of mid-August and we started this in mid-April. So it's, it's fantastic. It's sustaining and we're really delighted that you are able to join us on these regular occurrences and um, no sign that they're going to end anytime soon. So uh, prepare for the long haul. Um, so this evening, of course, we're um, presenting another of our Desert Island picks. And obviously we're delighted to have our very own Stephanie Wynn, um, who's been waiting patiently for her opportunity to, to select the images that she would take to that mythical desert island somewhere. We're not quite sure where that mythical desert island is, but uh, it might be somewhere off the coast of Wales, if I know Steph well. <laughs> um, just to give a bit of background, I know probably everybody in this meeting knows a fair about, a bit about Steph, but obviously she is one half of the great McCoy Wynn um, juggernaut of commercial photography in the northwest of England, but also a great photographer in her own right, uh, working on a number of projects. Uh, the most recent ones in the last two or three years have been uh, aligned quite closely to the Open Eye Gallery in Liverpool. So there's been the Transformative Moments um, a project, which was working with a, a group of women in, in Wirral. And, and that was looking at, uh, that was marking the 100th anniversary of women having the right to vote in the United Kingdom. Um, as well as a personal project, obviously the one that she talked about recently uh, on this forum was the triangulation project with Steve, uh, which was absolutely fascinating. And having just come back from uh, flogging myself around a few mountains in Scotland, I got an even greater appreciation of the effort involved in uh, taking triangulation photographs. So anyway, that's a little bit of background um, about Steph. And without further ado, I think we should move on and get Steph to basically Tell us about her first image. Well, what I'll do, I'll just share my screen. Tell me if you can see it correctly. So can everybody see the right screen then? Uh, oh. Yep. Okay, right, okay, lovely. So I'll go to my first image. So this is my first picture. Sally Mann, and it's from her uh, set of work, Immediate Family, which was published in 1988. Um, I didn't buy this book until 1991. Um, and just as a bit, of a bit of a background for you, um, for some years I worked as a social worker in Liverpool. Um, I worked part time, mainly one to one sessions at, the, at this time, maybe one to one sessions with young people involved in juvenile justice. So they were mainly offenders. Um, and I decided to take up photography as a, a photography course, as a, a new skill, as a means to working with these young people, as, as an extra tool in supporting them. And I bought this book before I started the course. Um, one of the reasons I bought it was because at the time myself, I had three young children of sort of fairly similar ages. Um, and it, it appealed to me from that perspective of being photographs of children. Um, and I was quite shocked um, when I actually discovered that there'd been outrage about the book. Because to me, any of the nudity or the very personal photographs of the children in the book were about that sort of natural way that a mother delights in their children. And I couldn't quite at the time see why there was such a furore um, about the, the, the nudity and, and the, the, the problems, particularly in America, about it. The reason I chose this specific photograph was because it's not just that it's about the children, it's about the landscape as well. And landscape's very important to me. And this landscape, to me, evokes what I think Virginia is. Now, I've never been to Virginia, but Sally Mann's photographs and her sense of place really conjure it up for me. It's a bit like um, when an author describes an emotion to you that you've never ever experienced, but somehow you're able to understand what it is. 
And for me, hair photographs of Virginia, not just in immediate family, but across the panoply of all their work, so evoke that sense of place. It's really quite important to me because I'm very rooted in where I live and it was something that appealed um, in, in that way, really. One, I mean, one thing that's quite interesting to me is, is you, you do, as we all do in 6x6, six six, describe mm -hmm. yourself as a documentary photographer. Mm -hmm. um, and what I was thinking about with this image is it really does sort of flip documentary photography on its head slightly, because I always think of documentary photography as slightly from the outside looking in. But mm. this project, this body of work, this book is absolutely not that. It's from the outs, it's from the inside looking out. Yes. And you know that it kind of has a lot of resonance. You've just tapped, um, tapped into that with the kind of family and stuff like that. But there are kind of other e elements to this image, which I know you, you picked out that you quite liked as well, which, which I wondered if you'd tell us about. Well, well yeah, it's, it's the, the other thing as well about her, her work and her photographs is that they have a level of wit they're clever images. I mean, it's the fact that in this image there's the little alligator, the, the, the inflatable alligator behind. It's those objects that are sort of next to the little girl, you know, the watermelon, the boots. What, what is she doing there? She's, she's on a folded up um, chair. She, she's covered up. Has she been swimming all day? Is she exhausted? Is she just play acting? You've no idea, but it's a scene of, I think, and, and the whole book is about the freedom of children to play. And it's about that freedom that if you lived somewhere like Virginia, you would run around as a small child with no clothes on, enjoying the landscape, playing, doing all, because there's that freedom to play. I mean, I've, in the last few years, I read her book, Hold Still, and she sort of describes and explains how she feels about sense of place as well um, and she also explains about how she felt about taking those photographs of her children so I mean I'd recommend anybody read that book. Yeah I mean it, it is an extraordinary book and, and what I mean what I love about this particular image um, is it's sort of dreamlike it's mm. dreamlike atmosphere and it does have this evocative feeling of childhood of innocence and, you know, and, you know, those of us with children, we're always trying to capture those timeless moments that we know we'll never be able to repeat. But there's always within that, there's a sort of finality to that moment. But I don't know if you agree, but when I look at the kind of Sally Mann approach um, to, to the, her children, if you like, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to stop at any particular time. It seems to be a, like a continuum, almost like a kind of, like a dream. Well, yeah, and I mean, most of her work is, is a diary of everything of her life. Um, you know, her work is, she's photographed a, a declining, a, you know, the sickness in her husband as he's declined with muscular dystrophy. You know, she's, pho she's photographed the body form. She's photographed landscapes in Virginia. She's photographed the, the self-portraits when she broke her leg, so, or her back rather. So she's had all, all of it is about this world that she lives in, really. Um, and, and a depiction of what it's like. I mean, it, it's also, it's one of those things that, um, I would say that I do documentary photography, but I don't just do documentary photography. I think that's probably, I don't set myself within that single sort of frame. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably you could say that like, you know, I mean, not that I would anyway, you know, align myself with someone like Ali, Sally Mann, but it's that, that this is a document of her life and her children's life, but then she goes outside that to look at other things, but all within, or the majority within that part of Virginia. Left. I mean, I, I, for me, when I, you know, when I look at her work and you know, slightly through reading the book to give it context, um, I really feel like I get to know her through the photography. And mm. I mean, you know, that is an absolutely incredible experience. I think that. Uh, almost unique amongst contemporary photographers that you really get a sense of, like you said, place, mm -hmm. person, family, you know, just the form of her life. It's, it's very rich. And yeah. she's amazing that she gives so much. Well, well pretend, possibly. I mean, there, there is a question of maybe how much of her children given as well. Um, because obviously 
although when I first got the book and, and in the years since, I've never ever thought of, it, thought of it as being in any way exploitative. But there is an argument that people could say that she did by taking up this, you know, 10 8 camera and taking these photographs of her children when they'd fallen or, you know, or her children when they were playing or that, that maybe she was setting herself outside her, same, her own family. And there is an argument about exploitation, though I don't necessarily think that's true. But, no. but there is that argument. So yeah. it, you know, she's an, in, um, and as I say, I think probably when you read her words, it really does help to understand her motivation and, and how she went about this. Mm. So everyone should read Hold Still. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, thanks for that. Um, great image to start with. So, should we move on to your second image? Second image, right. Now, this second image. Now, sort of as with Sally Mann, really, it was very, very difficult to select five images. And what I really would have liked to have done was have five collections of images from these people. So this photograph, really, this Robert Mapplethorpe photograph, or Maplethorpe, is just to um, represent his work. I would really like to have a lot of his photographs on a desert island. And the, one of the reasons I chose this one is because it sums up certain things that I like about images. Although the Sally Man was black and white and there's other black and whites I've chosen, I really enjoy colour. Um, so much of Maplethorpe's work is about form and shape and contours and light. And not a lot of it is about colour. And I really enjoy the colour photographs. Now, I was looking quite hard at this one. And the flowers, actually, as your kids, do actually look a bit overexposed. Um, but the colours are sort of quite glowing and you've got this sort of seeming overexposure on the orchids because this is a dye transfer print so it's gone through that very complex technical process um, and that in itself is interesting because I'm interested as well in process and I'm interested in a final image that will engage me. Mm. Um, the colours, I love the colours, it looks like an interior to me although it is probably a studio, it looks like window light. I like to be in interior spaces and looking at them. And this to me will conjure up an interior space. And if I was on a beach on a desert island somewhere, I could imagine having this as my little inside space. Mm, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting because obviously I think Maplethorpe, Maplethorpe, um, you, you, you don't associate them primarily with this sort of image. You associate him much more with the controversial stuff, the body stuff. Yeah. But once you know it's one of his and you look at it, um, there's, there's something about the, the way it's composed, the form, the shape, that you kind of know it's a maple thought. It's just oh, yeah. a bit weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 because people have often said, you know, it's a, it's a sort of sexualizing flowers. Really, they're sort of in the same form as as his sexual photographs. But you see, to me, I enjoy looking at photographs for the pleasure of looking at photographs. So it's the pleasure that you get from seeing a well organized, beautifully balanced image, and that's what he did with so many of his photographs. Um. I mean, th there's things about him um, that, I mean, I don't know how many people saw um, the documentary about him uh, in, in 2016, um, a documentary about him, uh, where it was quite critical of him. Um, and he was sort of portrayed, it's called Look at the Pictures, and he was portrayed as um, a rather self-absorbed, um, he sort of walked on other people, including his brother, to attain fame. I mean, I mean, he obviously he wasn't in this documentary to, to defend himself, but that was the implication about him. And also, I think there has been um, criticism of him because of his implied racist photographs of and exploitation of black men in some of his photographs. 
Um, so it's, you sort of look at these images and you think to yourself, well, maybe I don't really like him very, maybe if I had met him, I wouldn't really like him very much. And it's one of those things, it's like, can you really love the work of somebody that you may not really like as a person? And it, it's, it's one of those sorts of dilemmas about photography or about art or that can you enjoy the work of someone who maybe they're not that yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, that's, that's a kind of debate that we've, we've been touching on, I suppose, within Six by Six over the last few months, yeah. um, is this, this separation of church and state, if you like. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a really tricky one because at the end of the day, he was, he was, a, he was a master he's a master artist, he's a craftsman, he was unique, he was, he was groundbreaking, he was daring, he was, you know, you can, you can roll out as many superlatives about his work as you like, but again, we kind of are now starting to retrofit that yes. narrative around whether people were doing it for the right motives, what those motives were, and sometimes maybe we just have to stand back and say, right, oh, don't like the guy, don't maybe like what he stood for, but but we're like, I like his images, I like his work, I like to see those shapes and forms, that those constructed images, I like to see that, you know, the contrast, the light, the, the composition, that's what I enjoy looking at. And, and I think as well, there was another thing for me that, that he was important to me uh, because by sort of, um, sort of what year would it have been? About 1993, by 1993, um, I was actually, by that time, my marriage had broken down and I was a single parent with three children. Um, and I was having to do work and do sort of photographs for myself, maybe when I'd taken the kids to bed, I put the kids to bed at night and I set up like a small studio set up in the house and I would photograph flowers. And then within the subsequent years, I did actually get quite a bit of work with um, a floral artist that I worked with her. And Mapplethorpe's work was always something that I would go back to to look at, really. Mm. So that was why I'd like a collection of his work, uh, not just this one image if I was, was, was going to a desert island. And I think it's those things that you do that you try out and you, you're working at. Um, that, that he had that influence on me when I was working at that point. And I think it's probably had influence on me now when I maybe do work in interiors. I'm always looking at the light and looking where things are arranged. I, I would agree, actually. Um, knowing your work as I do, I, I think there's a lot that resonates with this particular image, which is fabulous. But uh, yeah, thanks for that one. Um, so should we tiptoe on to the number, number three, shall we? Number three. Right. So, this one, Martin Frank. Now, the importance to me of this photograph is it's absolute what I would say is near perfect composition. I love this photograph for its composition, its light, its shade. Everything is organized beautifully within the frame. Um, it was part of a, um, a commission that Martin Frank did to celebrate 40 years since the French um, had been given holiday pay. And she took a whole series of photographs and she actually said herself that she liked to evoke an atmosphere without necessarily describing it. And I think that's what this photograph does. To me, I know this is the South of France. I know that it's that burning heat that you get in Provence. And the arrangement of these people within this frame makes doesn't make a story as such but it makes sort of it just makes a pattern to look at that again gives me a sense of well-being just from looking it's about getting that enjoyment from looking um i think probably i do like photographs of people and i do take photographs of people but the thing is about photographs of people is that what you look at in the photograph is often the person, not how the photograph is constructed. Now, this one goes across that boundary because this is 
a well-constructed, beautifully composed photograph that has people in it, but it's not really about them. It's, n it's not a portrait. It's not necessarily telling the story. It's about these fantastic shapes and, and the abstraction of these people out in the sun. And, and I, I really love it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think to me, it's, it's also classic magnum. It's, it comes from, it's almost peak magnum. I think there's so many kind of aspects to it, which, you know, influenced my photography as well. Um, the, the, you can construct so many narratives within the image. You, I mean, you can sit there and look at that and you can, you can literally role play. You could, you could dream up a script as if it was a little five minute theater piece. Um, and also it has that real, odd thing about many of the great magnum pictures is all that kind of slightly humorous juxtapositioning well, you know, yeah. those those fabulous sort of white balls peppered around the pictures it's amazing and it's and, and, well that's it it's wit i like wit in photographs um just like the sally man there's that that the level of sort of you can see there's an intelligence in the photograph um but sort of to me in one respect it's not that important to me that I find the stories or look for narratives. I just like it for the sense of looking at it because of the arrangements of the shapes and how the people are formed within that rectangle. That's what I like looking at. Mm. So it sort of, it works on all those sort of different levels for me, really. And we were we were talking when we were talking about this picture earlier. We were saying that you know that's that old kind of standard, slightly tropey thing that makes sure when you're taking a picture of someone, there's not a lamppost growing out the top of their head. But to to align, I mean, this is like the planets aligning, and I suppose the reference there to these sort of spheres is the that's the planets. Everything. I mean, if 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 she had stepped one centimeter either way, yeah, I suspect the whole thing would have crashed. Yeah, it's just and the, and the guy. The guy in the middle would have stood up, you know, all things would have changed. But I think that's probably, she was somebody that composition was so important to her. Mm. That, yeah, there wouldn't be the lamppost coming out of the head because she would try so very hard for not to not, you know, publish that photograph that that had happened. Um, I mean, I saw this photograph as part of um, a retrospective of her work um, at Paris Photo in last year in 2019 at the um, Foundation Cartier-Bresson. And um, all, a huge amount of her work was there. Some really famous images, but I just really love this one. Mm, yeah. <laughs> because, because it has all those sort of compositional elements that, that I enjoy in a photograph. I think the word that comes, like, just sort of springs to my head is, it's got an aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's just lovely. It, it's, um, yeah, I think, um, well, I'm not going to betray the others, but I think of the, all the ones that you you picked tonight, that's going. That is my favourite. But anyway, well, you see, I think I can understand that, Colin, because you you come from the um, you come from the background of that narrative uh, yeah. of that classic magnum. That's the sort of work you like, isn't it? So I, I can see why that has happened, really. But that would yeah. be your favourite. Yeah, it still has. It has a depth. I mean, it has a depth beyond just being a documentary photograph as well and I think that's the aspect that you mm. maybe like as well yeah 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 that. well as I say it, it, it's like she said you know it evokes an atmosphere without necessarily describing it that that to me is south of France in the summer brilliant in a nutshell yeah beautiful <laughs> beautiful um I'm, I'm loath to move on because I'm just sitting there sort of dreaming and drooling at this photograph but Let's, let's see number four, please. Right, so, so total contrast, Andreas Gersky. <laughs> now, I probably wouldn't have chosen this photograph if we'd been doing this a few years ago, but I'll, I'll explain myself. Um, and first of all, there's also one proviso of what I'd have to have this photograph. It would have to be a minimum of three meters long. So I'd have to have a three meter long version of this picture on, on the uh, desert island. And the reason being was, I went to see his exhibition at the Hayward in 2018. And it's just, just to be able to stand back and take in the whole of this photograph, 
in um, a, a huge space like the Hayward and then being able to move into it and it is so detailed that you can see all the different things in the windows you know that the different coloured blinds and um, that there's a, about six people I think you, you can find in the windows there's um, an artist's easel there's uh, different lamps different plants so it, it gives this idea of all these people living within this block I also love architectural photographs um, and a sort of a, a bit of a historical sense um, when I first started taking photography, actually being paid to take photographs, one of the very first jobs um, I was given was to, it was by an architect's firm uh, just outside Manchester. And it was a friend of my sister's who worked in his architect's practice. And he said, would I go and take a few photographs for them of two of their new buildings? And I, so I agreed. And because as I used to say to students, you know, any opportunity that comes up, you should always take it. So I went and he said, the two buildings are the new stand at Liverpool Football Club and the new stand at Everton Football Club. Now, at the time I had um, a Nikon and um, a Mamiya C220. And I thought, I'm just going to be laughed literally out of the place if I turn up with this C220. And in fact, to have the first sort of commercial job that you're given is such a huge task to take on. So that would have been 1997, no, 96, 1996 it was. So I knew somebody who had a Hasselblad. So that was when I asked Steve, if he would help me on this job. <laughs> and that was the first McCoy Wynn job it was 1996, because Steve had the Hasselblad and I didn't. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, <laughs> and from there, from doing those photographs, we, we went on and we did quite a lot of architectural work and it really is something that I love. I love architecture. And that is why I love this image. Yes, it is just a block, but it has all those details. It's taken from that sort of halfway up the building sort of view. It's like he's, he's hovered in midair to get it. It, it you know, it's straight on. It's the fact that, you, that it, it's balanced. It, and, it, and as a huge sort of block from a distance, it looks like um, something abstract but then you can go in close and you can see all those details. I think, I mean, I think that's the kind of key to it, isn't it? That you can, form is, is, a, is a word that you keep coming back to in, in your images. And this is so different from the other ones we've looked at so far, because this is based on sort of a grid form rather than these beautiful flowing lines that we've seen in the other examples. But what this allows you to do is, is view it two ways, like you say, get really close up to the detail of it, but also, you know, more like what we're looking at it now, standing back and just enjoying the kind of texture of it. It's a really textural, beautiful image of something really quite functional and ugly. Yeah, well, and, and I think really as well, for, to be captivated by a photograph for me, that I have to have what I consider beauty in a photograph and I also have to have that level of de detail as well so that particularly if you go to a desert island you know you, you've got to have something that you can keep looking at and keep finding things in I mean uh, some years ago um, I spoke to a, a curator about long panoramic Im images and he said to me he didn't like them didn't like any big images because you couldn't take them in within one look and to me that's what's good about great big images. If you do have a big enough space, fair enough, you can stand back and you can take them all in. But if you're even in a smaller space, you can go in, you can look at the detail and you can walk along them. And that's what I like about this. And that's what I loved about that exhibition at the Haywards. I would have had all of them on a desert island at the Haywards so that I could, you know, would have kept me entertained for years and years and years 
looking at all those images. Um, and the, the parallel there, of course, is with your work, the triangulation work, which, you know, again, it, I mean, again, I come back to this sort of uh, the sense that, you you know, I love going really, really close. And I suppose that's the photographer's thing that we're, mm. we're always looking for perfection. Mm. Um, we are perfectionists. And when you get something on a scale like this, because I think this is three images, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's three. Stitched together. But you really, you, you almost can't get close enough. You almost you know you're, you're almost trying to find the imperfection mm -hmm. but when you're that close to a Gursky you're highly unlikely to find an imperfection well one you're not that I mean that's what I really like about it I mean I did have a, a debate with myself about which which obviously because there's only sort of five and one of the other photographers I did think about um was Simon Norfolk um but obviously when Adam did this Adam had a Simon Norfolk so I thought well we, we can't do overkill on Simon really but mm -hmm. It, it as well, he's another person that I would actually say that his photographs are beautiful and detailed and engaging. And because like this, if you get engaged and you're able to look into something, that then if you do have something to say, your audience is there waiting to be told, isn't it? Mm, absolutely, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, I mean, the, the frustration is with, with Gursky's work, and I suppose is that, you do need that space to see it properly. Yeah. You're only likely ever to see it in somewhere like, I don't know, the Turbine Hall at the Tate or the Hayward or you know, somewhere monstrous, yeah. um, which is a good island. thing. Sorry? Or a desert island. Or a desert island. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, there's nothing to say a desert island can't have an enormous art gallery. I mean, we set the rules around here. So yeah, it's, it's interesting, but it is quite a different image to, to the other ones you've chosen. I mean, it, it is a very, it's, it's a big contrast, I would say, to all the yeah. other ones, because it doesn't, it doesn't have that, it doesn't have this, the same flowing emotion. It's not, to me, it's not an emotional image, this. It's, it's a very, ta almost tactile image, but it's not an emotional image. But yeah, I think, well, except for the fact, I think that, well, as I say, when you zoom in close, you see little elements of all those different people's lives that are quite fascinating. You know, the, the, there's what there's two windows where there's piles and piles of books right across the windows, and then there's there's others that have got sort of shutters so they're so private you can't see anything, and then there's other people that've got these huge plants growing in the window, and then as I say, there's one with well I think there's two with artist easels in the window, so you yeah. sort of got this you're able to uh, get right in and, and try and sort of make some analysis of all these people who live in this grid. Mm. So yeah. it's like, like, like a little, a little, a little town all together, isn't it? You know, in a grid. It is, and I mean, it's, it's very much the sort of human jungle. And I mean, again, if you go back to sort of the Sally Man, the jungle, if you like, was Virginia, was this, was nature, was this really kind of fecund sort of existence that that, that they built up there. Mm -hmm. But this is the this is the other this is the urban human jungle, yeah. and. It's, but it's still a human condition, and it's, it's yeah. and this is Paris. <laughs> it's Paris, I know, of all places, uh, yeah. which you associate with a much more sort of I don't know flowing culture. But this, yeah, it's it's phenomenal, phenomenal. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and just another point, actually, not about the photograph, but after we did the the, the first job of um, of LFC and, and EFC, um, I was able to buy my own Hasselblad. So. <laughs> So I, so we we continued to work together, but we, we had a Hasselblad each. You, you're trying to tell me you didn't marry him for his Hasselblad? <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> well, I didn't know that story. I have to admit, and um, it, it's fantastic embellishment of of the past. <laughs> love it, absolutely love it. Um, maybe that brings us quite neatly to to your fifth and final image. Fifth and final image, and this is very different again. Now. This is um, John Blakemore, um, The Garden, Fragments of a History, number one. And it sort of brings me sort of a bit back round, really, to, to the stage in my life when I was sort of doing maple, looking at Maplethorpe and thinking about sort of still life type of things and being confined to being having to do stuff either within my own home or at quite short distances away uh, because I had the like responsibility of of having other jobs as well as looking after three children on my own. And I was always really drawn to Blakemore's work. I love his, 
landscape work. I love the movement uh, because the multiple exposures that he gets in his trees photographs. Um, and some years ago, we, we did some photographs um, about um, going to find uh, Steve's great uncle's grave, uh, who was killed in the First World War. And at the time, I remember thinking, how do you show the passage of time just through a single image or sets of images? And it, John Blakewell was somebody who I went back to with that because we decided to sort of do some layered images and that's what he's got here. These are multiple exposure images and these are, is the history of his garden. It's all those things, the detritus that he's dug up in the garden over a series of years, collected it together and then photographed it as a complete image. I think that's his, the, the cat that, that died some years previous. Um, stuff that was from all the people who'd lived in the house before. Um, and it's a whole history of where he lives. Again, it's it's that sort of back to your own place. And yeah, I, I, what I love about this, the word that, that when I was thinking about this this image, because I'm not not very familiar with his work at all, and and that description of time and it it's like a midden. It's <laughs> like it's it's like the, the digging up a midden and, and it's actually the way it's photographed you almost think that it, that's what it is it's a it's sort of something a, a little time vault that's been opened up and you can see aspects of it and the, the it kind of recesses back so the things that are at the back are slightly darker in shade or maybe the older things whereas the things that are, are lighter and newer are, are to the foreground and it just had that almost architect um yeah, archaeological. It, it is. It's an archaeology. I mean, he. I mean, I actually bought a print from him last year of this image. I have actually got this this image on the wall, um, and it's it's a silver print image, and it's it's just so good to look into. Again, I think it's probably if you'd say there was a theme among the photographs that I've chosen, is that it's that. Um, detail except maybe the the Mapplethorpe but it's the detail of being able to look to something for a long time and always keep finding something else in there mm. um and and also to me this is a documentary photograph you know this is a document of a history of that garden this is all those people that lived there prior to John Blakemore and this is all you know the animals that died the tools that were lost and this is a document of a place to me so and, and that's also, the spread idea of what documentary is th this is documentary uh, absolutely and i mean the interesting thing is you made the reference to you know a graveyard and stuff like that this to me looks like a sort of tombstone mm -hmm. it has that element about it um there's a fantastic um graveyard in edinburgh uh, greyfriars kirk um, and and a lot of amazing old tombstones that have almost shamanic backgrounds. Uh, you, you don't see a lot of Christianity in them. There's mm -hmm. something really dark about them, and it really brings to mind for me that that kind of relationship with the past. That, that the past isn't something that you can neatly box and and you know write a memorial and and stick on top of a of a of a grave it's something much more free-flowing and fluid. And I think that is really something that's brought out in the textures, but uh, yeah. And, and, and then obviously on screen, I don't think on screen you probably can see as much as, as you can see when you, when you see the, the, the print. And these images to me, as I say, that, that to me is a, is a true document that mm. shows, it shows time, it shows history. Did, did you see his images first of all in, um, exhibition form or book form in or books no i i saw them in books actually um and then i did notice that last year um he was doing a whole set of prints because he said this was going to be the sort of the last set of prints that he wanted to do um and i was fortunate enough at the time to have the money to buy one so i bought one <laughs> wow. um, yeah. yeah so yeah it's it's beautiful and, and i mean it's um I think you kind of made reference there that it almost links back circular in a circular motion to the to the Sally Man. Yeah, it has something of of that, doesn't it? 
yeah I mean all of them really have, have this idea of I think sense of place and form and um composition and and I think probably this has got history in it as well mm. so it, it's those it, it's all those things that are important to me it's about the actual composition and structure of the image that gives me that sense of well-being just by looking yeah that's that's fabulous and very interesting that you kind of very much say that this out of all the images for you represents probably documentary the strongest which i think a lot of people looking at these five images might say that well this one is the one that probably if you like is least documentary that's really interesting yeah, but it is a history it's a document of a place yeah yeah, yeah. it's fabulous um of course bringing it slightly to a close but you have the unenviable task of mm -hmm. only taking one of the five images with you yeah. which would that be and why um i was debating whether i would i was yeah no i have decided no i will take the john blake more i have decided i'll take the john blake more because it has those layers. I was sort of, I think, I don't know if I said to you the other day, it might have taken the Sally Man, but I, I think no, because I think maybe the John Blakemore as well, it's something about, I know English gardens and that's also my sense of place as well. So it's because it evokes a garden too, that that is why I would, I would go with the John Blakemore. Yeah, it's a beautiful image. I can, I can certainly see that, absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's been absolutely fascinating five images um i suspect there are there are some um comments and questions um i, I mean to be honest I, I feel we could go on talking all night about these it just it just opens up so much it's just amazing um but we have to we have to cast you off to your desert island um mm -hmm. and we're we give you the bible i'm not sure you wanted to take the bible actually no not bothered, not bothered with the bible i suppose okay. like light fires with the pages well <laughs> that's an approach <laughs> um but we we do ask you to to take you can take another book with you in which case which one would that be right well i actually do read an awful lot uh, uh, i read a lot of literature um but i find it so hard to choose these five photographs that i decided to, to take another photo book and this is the photo book that i'm going to take and it's peter marlowe's the english cathedral um now i've just said of course that I, I am not religious in any way but i love cathedrals because to me it's about the ingenuity and the persistence of humanity that they are and the, the creative ability of humanity that they've been able to create these incredible buildings in in times when you know that the, there wasn't the engineering capacity that we have now um, and also because I love interior spaces and to be in a huge interior space like a cathedral, I would like that if I was out on a desert island. And there's also another reason is because I sort of feel um, as if I did Peter Marlowe a disservice. Um, because in 1993, I went to see his exhibition, Liverpool Looking Out to See at the Open Eye Gallery. Um, and he, he was there to, at the launch. And I thought, oh, here we go again. I just thought, here's some southern photographer, uh, somebody who's based in the south, and they've come up to Liverpool and they're doing the um, photograph the poverty of Liverpool to improve his position and his ego and his job. It was sort of like, you know, the wor I, I thought at the time it was possibly the worst sort of type of photojournalistic poverty porn. Um, and, and the other thing was he had on a really hideous leather jacket. So I was sort of, but then when I saw this book, I thought, well, you know, maybe I did him a disservice. Maybe I've, I've sort of mellowed and maybe I don't think as much about uh, Liverpool looking out to sea as, as in such negative terms as I did then. Um, of course, it is a misnomer because a lot of it is photographed in Bidston, in, near Birkenhead, not in Liverpool at all. Um, but I, so I would take this because I felt as if I did him a disservice, and I love these photographs of interiors. 
It's quite interesting because um, I, I happen to really like the Peter Marlowe book. Um, <laughs> it was a sort of part of my introduction, if you like, to Merseyside before I moved down here. I, I, I find a lot of warmth and compassion and humour in it, but I, I totally understand your point of view and, you know, you, if you like, as an insider, I, I, I bow to your, um, I, I yeah, defer. I that, sort of, that sort of, you know, colonialist, I always think. Absolutely, yeah. Just yeah. waltzing in and, you know. But then here, here's, the, here's the thing, if we're prepared to separate um, the, the, Robert, the bad aspects of M Robert Mapplethorpe's character, maybe we forgive Peter Marlowe and his jacket. Well, I well, exactly. I forgive him his jacket and I would take the English cathedral with me. And, and of course, then we can use a religious metaphor and say that maybe the English cathedral is, is his act of atonement. <laughs> Liverpool looking out to sea. Yeah. So, that's great. And then, of course, lastly, you get to take a luxury with right, you. Right. Now, my luxury, right. So when my youngest daughter, Madeline, was born, um, Steve and I had to do quite a lot of work um, up and down the country working for a sort of different, like the, at the time, the Countryside Agency. And as she grew up as a, a very small child, um, we, ha we actually took her with us. Um, so we, you know, we, and we sometimes would take a few children with us and we'd have to corral them in one area while we were taking photographs in the landscapes, but they were quite safe, you know. Anyway, uh, what we did with Madeline was that we used to play music in the car and she has got a very eclectic taste in music. And what I would like as my luxury is Madeline to do me one of her playlists and I'd need something to play on it. And it will have on it, you know, Marvin Gaye and Amy Winehouse and David Bowie because she just covers so many different ranges of, of, of music over probably about the last 70 years that she really likes so I would like a playlist from Madeline. Well we'll, we'll certainly grant you all that and um, also thank you very much um, Stephanie Wynn it's been fantastic uh, to hear and see all about your desert island picks that's and it. that's it so have a great fortnight thanks again and see you all soon. Thanks everybody. Well,